Good afternoon. Thank you for joining our course. This is an unconventional session, and I will start by those following cases. You start your cataract surgery, and it's going smooth. And at this stage, when you're trying to remove the nucleus, this happens, a dropped nucleus. In the second case, this patient complains of decreased vision, and you see that he has a nucleoscarotic lens and an epinatural membrane. The third case is a diabetic who is poorly controlled and has decreased vision that's progressive. And you look, you see the cornea is opaque, cataract, and on the B scan, there's a TRD with a macula off. So, Mohammed, uh, what's the common theme that you see here? The theme of the previous scenarios is communication. Communication is as important as the surgery itself. We all want to provide our patients the best care we can. Many points has to be addressed. The management plan, timing, whether sequential versus combined versus in-person consultation, a discussion about the visual potential, all of these details has to be addressed with everyone involved. And since these cases are complex by nature, we must put the patient in the center of our attention. Thank you, Mohammed. So on the rest of this 30 minutes, we will be talking about a clinical approach to cataract surgery in the setting of posterior pro pathology and about combined versus sequential cataract and, vit and vitrectomy and vitrectomy for drop lens uh, and I will be presenting it myself, I'm Adil Lagili. The second part will be by Dr. Mohamed al Mutlaq. he will be talking about cataract surgery in the vitrectomized eye. Dr. Rafa Farag will be talking about cataract surgery in the setting of high myopia and Dr. Turki bin Dakhil will be talking about the somewhat complex uh, subject of IR calculation in difficult scenarios. So starting with the uh, cataract and the setting of posterior pro pathology, uh, we know that cataract surgery makes our patients happy. And as surgeons, we like to do them ourselves too. But it's important to know that cataracts in different situations need to be dealt with differently. So in instance, AMD, there is conflicting data about whether the cataract surgery actually improves visions. We know that within one year, the cataract does improve vision. However, when comparing uh, unilateral cataract surgery, the unoperated eye with the operated eye, we found that the unoperated eye was less likely to progress than the operated eye. It's also important to know that timing in wet AMD is very critical, and only when we achieve control of the choroidal and vascular membranes is the time that we start considering doing the cataract surgery. We also have to counsel the patient guard the prognosis that they might face and that they will still uh, get their regular treatment for their AMD even after the cataract surgery. In the setting of vitromacular diseases and in case of uh, epiretinal membrane, it is in many cases very difficult to know what's the visual uh, complaint in patients. And this is why the prognosis after the surgery can be uncertain. And a separate study that compared outcomes of concurrent cataract surgery with, ret with retinal peeling alone reported that there were no significant differences in macular thickness or visual acuity. In the case of vein occlusion, uh, we know that postoperative cystoid macular edema in uncomplicated cases can occur in 30 times higher than uh, non-vein uh, occlusion eye. Now we come to the complicated subject of cataract and diabetic retinopathy. We know that patients uh, who are diabetic can develop cataract at a higher rate, especially posterior subcapsular cataract. The degree of cataract seen in, in many cases does not correspond to the visual acuity. You should get an OCT or uh, fluorescein angiography. Incidence rate of new diabetic retinopathy doubles actually after the surgery and the rate of progression in pre-existing condition can even increase. Progression may be lower when focal and PRP laser is applied before the cataract surgery. However, in many instances, this cannot be done because the cataract preclude the visualization. Patients with significant diabetic retinopathy should be stable before cataract surgery. However, knowing that those patients have an ongoing condition that might continue even after the cataract surgery, we should not deprive them from the right of having their vision improved by having their cataract removed. Also, counseling to achieve tight control of hemoglobin A1C is very essential in these cases. Now we go to the diabetic macular edema and cataract. 
people were much more worried about new vascularization after the cataract surgery. However, with the advent of the PRP and anti-VEGF and fecal emulsification, the worry shifted towards diabetic macular edema. The timing of performing surgery is typically when you still can see the fundus and do laser. In pre-existing diabetic macular edema or priorly treated uh, eyes, cataract surgery can increase the risk to up to 50%. And the risk in non-pre-existing diabetic macular edema was associated with the preoperative grade of retinopathy. Perioperative anti-VEGF or steroid are recommended in those cases. There's also the special condition of uh, pseudophytic uh, cystoid macular edema. And it's important to note that these are two different entities. The major difference is in the presence of um, typical uh, telloid appearance on the fluorescein angiography and the hot disk. There is a difference in the management of two, the bo both of the conditions. Talking about cataract and retin detachment, um, with the advent of fecal emulsification, we still have a high number of posterior vitreous detachment, with, which is one of the risk factors for retin detachment, and it reaches up to 60% after a year of the cataract surgery. The incidence of retin detachment, on the other hand, is variable. Studies has shown that it, it reaches up to 8%. But the cumulative probability of RD was five times higher in pseudophytic eyes. And now we will shift gears towards uh, combined versus sequential fatal emulsification and vitrectomy. It's important to know that cataract formation and progression are inevitable in cases of vitrectomy. And there are a lot of advantages that comes with the combination surgery. This includes better vision if the cataract was significant and less recovery time, cost, and anesthesia and surgical risks uh, mitigation. Vitreotinous surgeons prefer them because they improve the visualization and helps in uh, peripheral shaving. And actually studies has shown that there are higher uh, closure rates of full thickness macular hole when combining the surgeries. The disadvantages uh, include post-operative inflammation with high risk of synechia and cystoid macular edema. Also, uh, risks that happen during the surgery from the dim red reflex due to vitreous hemorrhage, corneal edema that may, might preclude visualization. It's also important to know that the refractive outcomes might be less predictable. This is because IL calculation is less reliable. Imponad also can cause IOL displacement, opacification, and sometimes pupillary capture. And there are lots of logistical and financial uh, components to the matter because having an available cataract surgeon that would do a case with you if you're not comfortable in doing the cataract surgery is not always possible. There's also the uh, financial part related to the insurers because not all insurers pay the full amount. And if uh, a veteran surgeon performs the sur combined surgery himself, uh, it is typically a call for less referral to him because people think that uh, those who do all the surgeries by themselves are less um, worthy of the referral. So we move to the surgical pearls related to the combined cataract surgery and vitrectomy. It is very important to know that preoperative counseling does affect a lot. Everyone's neighbor had a cataract surgery with what was uneventful and he had the vision of 2020. And you don't want your patient to be that person who says that he had the bad uh, surgery. It is also very important that both surgeons are involved in the consent because everyone has to explain his part of the surgery. IOL selection is very important. Preferable to have those uh, IOLs with large optics because they allow for better peripheral visualization. Careful surgical planning is very important. Knowing a typical uh, cataract surgeon will sit temporarily and you putting your um, infusion line uh, infratemporarily will also um, cause a lot of difficulties for his cataract surgery. Of course, there are issues regarding visualization, so you want to use all the dyes that you have in your hand to allow you to see the capsule. You want to go towards uh, smaller capsulorexes, not too small. Also, uh, avoid causing corneal edema as much as possible, especially stromal hydration. Also, ensuring that the pupil is dilated. 
Capsulotomy is also very important uh, to be addressed earlier because if you want to create a capsulotomy at the time of the surgery, there's a high risk of uh, migration of the tamponade. Do you want to suture all of the wounds in your, in your surgery? Because uh, in those cases, you have a lot of manipulation and, and you don't want to end up with a hypotony and a choroidal detachment. In terms of post-op medication, you want to keep the patient on high frequency steroid because you expect a lot of inflammation in the post-operative period. And unlike the usual practice in retina, you want to avoid dilation uh, to prevent the eye oil from displacing forward. Going back to the first case, this was the ideal situation. The VR surgeon was in the OR. He came and took the lens out and placed a sulcus eye oil at the same time. The largest meta-analysis talked about a patient who did not receive same-day vitrectomy. PVV done in the three to seven days period associated with the best outcome. But this also has to be uh, in the setting of uh, good visualization. The other important point is the placement of the eye oil. So if you have an intact anterior capsule, always place a three-piece eye oil there. I will be speaking today about cataract post vitrectomy. First, which phacic eyes needs sparse planar vitrectomy? And the answer, there are many indications for vitrectomy in phacic eyes. Cataract post vitrectomy can be divided into three types, nuclear sclerosis, posterior capsular cataract, and intumescent white cataract. First, nuclear sclerosis, more of a gradual form of cataract with uh, oxidative stress. Clinicians tend to underestimate these lens changes while it affects the visual function. Second, the posterior capsular cataract, more of a rapid form related to a mechanical component, either silicon oil, gas, or instrumentation. Lens should be examined carefully for posterior capsule violation. And third, the intumescent white cataract, more of sudden, rapid drop of vision related to a violated capsule and presents as white cataract. Preoperative evaluation should be thorough. More time in the clinic needed. Visual potential in these cases sometimes is an educated guess. Outcome uh, should be discussed in details with patients as they are different from the conventional cataract patients. Pre-existing retinal pathology may worsen and may need uh, intervention. Contralateral eye should be examined and uh, the situation should be documented. Those patients require more testing in terms of refraction, TAM LI, a lower threshold for uh, testing such with B-scan, OCT, FFA, and IOL calculation, and axial length to aid with the plan of management whether patients needs intravitreal injection or a certain type of uh, IOL power. Intraocular lens calculation is generally challenging. Acrylic hydrophobic lens is the best ideal option for these patients. Toric IOL can be used, but there is a higher chance of rotation. Um, should we use premium lenses in those patients? The lenses are just getting better and better. However, there are a lot of cons against using these lenses. The retinal pathology may progress and may recur. These eyes do not have the best optics or visual potential. Zonulopathy may be present in these eyes. So I'd rather avoid premium lenses in, the, in those patients. Intraoperative difficulties can be seen in five situations in terms of anesthesia, fluidics, the capsule anterior and posterior, reverse pupillary block, and the pupil and weakened zonules. The decision is very important regarding anesthesia, whether it will be local versus topical versus rarely GA. And it all depends on the length of the surgery, the cooperation of the patient, and the axial length. Fluidics, the recommendation is to go for a lower bottle or IOP and lower aspiration. The anterior capsule tend to be difficult to puncture, especially in the presence of silicone, which induce fibroblast and epithelial growth. The anterior capsule may extend and present as a, an Argentinian flag because of the intumescent white cataract. Reverse pupillary block can be seen in cataract post vitrectomy and by definition it's a concave iris configuration toward the anterior lens capsule. The clinical picture is more of a hyper deep AC, pain and discomfort with a difficult view related to angulation and of the surgical instrumentation. 
So how to deal with uh, reverse pupillary block? The reverse pupillary block can be dealt with a lower infusion, a second instrument to raise the iris, and finally iris retractor can solve the situation. These eyes can present with, as a small pupil or a weakened zonule, so the presence of iris hooks, capsular hooks, CTRs can be helpful. The posterior capsule tend to be floppy, and the risk of PCR is higher with a nucleus drop. Hydrodissection is better to be avoided in the presence of posterior capsular weak. Post-operatively, intense control of inflammation with steroids, non-steroidals to prevent cystoid macular edema and diabetic macular edema is recommended. Reverse pupillary block can present in the post-operative period with an elevated IOP, pigment dispersion and hyphema, a picture of iris tr uh, transillumination and a chronically elevated IOP, similar to that we see with UGH. And reverse pupillary block postoperatively can be easily dealt with with a laser PI in the post-operative period. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Rafa Ferrer and I will briefly take you through some pearls of cataract surgery and high myopia. As we all know, myopia is a condition where the focal point of an eye is located anterior to the fovea, leading to unclear images. Myopia is classified as high when spherical equivalent is minus 6 diopters or more and the axial length is 26.5 mm or more, but pathological myopia is when the axial length is 32.5 mm or more and the spherical equivalent is minus 8 diopters or more. According to the Blue Mountain Eye Study, myopia is associated with increased incidence of nucleus sclerosis and posterior subcapsular cataract, and as a result, increased incidence of cataract surgery. This is why it is important to be prepared for the challenges one might face in cataract surgery for high myopic patients. Before surgery, it is of great importance to uncover any history of prior refractive surgery, which can influence the choice of IL formula and prognosis. It is also important to perform a thorough dilated fundus exam to rule out any active retinal pathology. It is also very important to maintain realistic expectations in these patients. They need to be aware of postoperative difficulty with near vision and significant anisometropia necessitating sequential bilateral cataract surgery. The possibility of a second procedure to optimize refractive outcome should also be emphasized. Thorough counseling and informed consent to address the increased risk of retinal detachment and variable postoperative refractive errors should also be carried out. As for IL calculations, standard formulas tend to select IOLs of insufficient power, leading to unwanted hyperopia postoperatively. Many methods have been proposed to overcome this issue, including A constant optimization for positive and negative IOLs, axial length adjustments, using other methods that utilize artificial intelligence and pattern recognition that are independent of effective lens position and axial length, there are trends toward promising ray tracing and intraoperative apparometry as well. Keep in mind that the aim is to always put an IOL regardless of its power. It acts as a barrier to the anterior vitreous movement and subsequent retinal detachment. Avoid silicon IOLs as these patients have a higher chance to undergo retinal surgery in the future. You may target minus 1 to minus 2 diopter of postoperative refraction to compensate for any hyperopic surprises, especially if using negative IOLs. It is also better to stay away from multifocal IOLs and use monofocal IOLs instead, as they are less sensitive to the vertical decentration, which were found to be more in myopic eyes. At the time of surgery, to avoid the higher risk of globe perforation with retrobulbar and peribulbar anesthesia in this group of patients, topical or subtenon anesthesia may be a better alternative. Early recognition of globe perforation signs like hypotony and loss of red reflex and its management by vitreoretinal surgeon could also improve prognosis. One of the intraoperative challenges is the increased depth of the anterior chamber, which can be minimized by decreasing the irrigating bottle height and increasing the flow rate. Lens iris diaphragmer topulgian syndrome occurs when there is 360 degrees contact between the iris and capsule, leading to reverse pupillary block. This can be overcome using a blunt instrument like a spatula to elevate the pupil margin and allow fluid to flow posteriorly and equalize pressure. It is also of great importance to avoid anterior chamber depth fluctuations and traction on the vitreous space, which may predispose to postoperative retinal detachment. This can be achieved through minimizing incision leak and filling the anterior chamber with cohesive viscoelastic or BSS prior to removing any instrument from the eye.
After surgery, it is important to remember that high myopic patients have a higher risk of steroid responsiveness and increased intraocular pressure, so they would benefit from frequent IOP monitoring or shorter course of topical steroids or using an alternative anti-inflammatory medication. Refractive surprises are common in high myopic patients. Putting into consideration the status of the lens in the other eye, one may have the option of optimizing IOL calculations for the second eye prior to cataract surgery. However, if the patient's other eye was pseudophagic, this leaves the surgeon with the option of IOL exchange or piggyback IOL or performing cornea refractive surgery instead. Posterior capsule opacification rate is higher in high myopes. This can be minimized intraoperatively with using square-edged IOLs and CTRs or performing 360 anterior capsule polishing. Otherwise, it can be dealt with postoperatively with NDR capsulotomy. Other postoperative retinal complications will be discussed by the retina specialist in this course. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone. This is Dr. Turki Ben Dakhil. In the next few minutes, I will be talking about IOL calculation in patients with axial myopia. I have no financial disclosures to report. When we encounter a patient with axial myopia, we should take care of IOL power selected for this patient. And we have to raise several concerns about axial length measurement accuracy, formula accuracy, the effect of high axial length on the astigmatic power of toric IOL, and that if the patient underwent refractive surgery, either corneal based or lens based, also we should check the refraction of the fellow eye. Starting with the axial length measurement, as we all know, axial length of the eye can be measured using ultrasound biometry, whether contact or immersion, and also by optical biometry. When we use ultrasound biometry to measure the axial length in eye filled with silicon oil, we should adjust the speed of ultrasound in order to avoid inaccurate axial length measurement. To be more precise, this adjustment should be based on the type of silicon oil used, as you can see here. Failure to adjust the velocity can result in false longer axial length measurement, which in turn can result in postoperative hyperopic surprise. The shape of IOL's optic is also important in eyes filled with silicon oil. The recommended shape is convex plano, whereas the worst type of IOL geometry is the biconvex optic. Also, the density of cataract have an impact on the axial length measurement when using ultrasound. Dense cataract make the ultrasound waves to travel faster than usual, which gives false short axial length. This error can result in more myopic results than intended. Posterior staphyloma is an issue in both optical and ultrasound biometry. Dealing with posterior staphyloma is usually done by confirming the axial length measurement of optical biometry by ultrasound B-scan. Newer devices with incorporated macular OCT to verify the measurement to the macula, this can enhance the accuracy of the axial length measurement. It also recommended to measure the axial length before dilation for better fixation of the eye during the test. For eyes filled with silicon oil, don't forget to use silicon oil mode in your biometry. As we know, optical biometry is more accurate than ultrasound, but the limitation of optical biometry is the limited penetrance ability in case of dense mature cataract. Therefore, the recommended time of doing IOL calculation is as early as possible after retina surgery. Almost all the formulas have comparable accuracy in eyes filled within normal range of axial length, but the accuracy is variable when we measure long axial length. Accurate prediction of refractive outcomes in vitrectomized eye is difficult for multiple reasons. First, because of the absence of vitreous in the posterior segment, which can result in unusually deep and unstable anterior chamber, which increase the mobility of the posterior chamber IOL even after the surgery. Second, because of high risk of zonulopathy in vitrectomized eye, which might lead to instability of the lens capsular back complex and misalignment of the IOL. So in general, IOL constants optimization is required in some formulas. Millis and his colleagues study the accuracy of IOL power, and they found that the Holiday 1, Hofer Q, SRKT, and Hagis tend to underestimate the IOL power when the axial length is more than 26, which result in hyperopic outcome. However, adjustment of axial length using one cock factor results in myopic outcome instead of hyperopic outcome. Holiday 2 formula can also result in hyperopic outcome whereas newer formula such as Olsen and Barrett tend to have better accuracy and very close to intended postoperative spherical equivalent.
Also, they studies the impact of anterior chamber depth on the refractive results. Hages and Barrett formulas found to be most accurate regardless of the anterior chamber depth. Apart from Olsen, all the remaining formulas tend to result in hyperbic outcome in very deep anterior chamber. What if we encounter a post-vitrectomized eye? Dr. Tan and his colleagues studied retrospectively 40 eyes with axial length of 26 or more who underwent Bars Plana vitrectomy. They found that Evo followed by Kane followed by Barrett Universal and SRKT are the most accurate formulas to achieve plus or minus quarter diopter of intended post-operative spherical equivalent. However, almost all formulas achieved plus or minus one diopter in about 80% of the cases. Axial length and keratometric readings can also affect the effective power of toric IOL. The amount of correction of astigmatism by toric IOL is exaggerated with the longer axial length and the higher K readings. So if we implant the same toric IOL in two eyes, the first eye axial length is 26 and the second eye is 30 mm, the amount of correction of astigmatism will be more in the longer eye. Also, we have to ask the patient about previous refractive surgery. One of the essential questions nowadays before cataract surgery is to ask the patient about previous refractive surgery, either corneal-based or lens-based, especially in patients with long axial length. Unnoted previous corneal myopic ablation can result in overestimation of K readings, which in turn cause underestimation of IOL power and results in post-operative hyperbic surprises. So for eyes who underwent myopic ablation, we should take care about keratometric readings. In general, we have two methods. The first method is the single K in which we depend on the current post-operative or post-refractive keratometric readings. And usually if we will have a post-operative surprise, it will be a hyperbic surprise. The second method is double K method in which we use the K readings before the refractive surgery to estimate the effective lens position and post-operative K readings to calculate the IOL power. In a clinical history method, we use pre-operative K readings and then subtract it by the change in manifest refraction at corneal plane. This method is no longer considered the gold standard due to several disadvantages, such as the unavailability of pre-operative data, also because this method is highly affected by the change in refraction due to progression of nuclear sclerosis and the progression of axial length. Also, this method is not suitable for post RKIs. So even if you have a pre-operative and post-operative data, try to avoid clinical history method. So I will mention the current most popular methods. The first method is Ascaris website. In this Ascaris website, we can get the K readings from tomography or topographic machine in form of SIM-K or total corneal power or equivalent K readings, what is called also AKR. Then enter it on this website and the website will calculate it with different formulas. The second method is double K reading. On 2003, Dr. Arambari published an article to correct the error in effective lens position using double K method for SRKT formula, Holiday 1 formula, and Hofer Q formula, but not for Hague's formula. The third method is Barrett True K formula. Recently, Dr. Graham Barrett launched his online calculator, which depends on True K to calculate the IOL power after refractive surgery. So it uses double K method as well. Now it is considered as one of the most reliable option after myopic ablation. Intraoperative wavefront aberrometry can be also used to calculate the IOL power with variable results regarding its accuracy among the studies. Moving to lens-based refractive surgery, ICL or artisan have minimal effect on axial length measurement and these are the correction factors of axial length based on the ICL power. Target post-operative spherical equivalent should be tailored based on the refraction of the fellow eye. We can divide it into two situations. The first situation if the fellow eye is phicic. In this situation, we can ask the patient to wear glasses if the difference is no more than three diopters of myopia, or we can discuss also with the patient the need to wear contact lens in an operated eye. The decision of sequential cataract surgery can be discussed in addition to refractive surgery, either corneal or lens-based. However, if the fellow eye is pseudophagic, we have the following option. 
glasses, contact lens, matching the target refraction of the eye that we will operate on to the pseudophagic eye. IOL exchange can be done especially if the surgery of the first eye is recent. Another option is sulcus-based IOL to match the refraction of the other eye. Also, we can do refractive surgery to the pseudophagic eye to avoid significant anisometropia. Thank you.